Hi there, everyone. Um, my name is Aaron Prophet. I'm a associate professor of Japanese studies at the University at uh, the University at Albany, uh, SUNY. Um, my PhD is in Buddhist studies, uh, and I focus on medieval Japanese Buddhism, but kind of broadly in issues re related to Mahayana Buddhism, Buddhist modernism, and uh, and so on. Um, today I'll be talking about the Lotus Sutra, which for the East Asian world is one of the most influential, if perhaps not the most influential sutra, uh, kind of across East Asia. When I started teaching here, and I, uh, here at Albany, I teach in the East Asian Studies Department. Um, and I, I, when I first started teaching, I was trying to figure out what would be the most useful class to teach for students. Like what's something East Asian Buddhism related that whether you're a specialist in China or Korea or Japan or just generally interested, that would be the most useful. And I figured it would be the Lotus Sutra, right? Um, I want to start off by, by, by telling a little story. Um, that, that this is actually something that I mention uh, in my book as well, which is on esoteric Pure Land traditions. But uh, several years ago, it's got to be at least 10 years or more, I was at Ryukoku for a, for a lecture. The keynote speaker, kind of before he began his presentation, was talking about uh, kind of the diversity and fluidity of Japanese Buddhism. And he was relating a story about how earlier in the day he had had lunch with some of the seminary students at Ryukoku. And one of the students there kind of you know, very proudly declared, I've read everything that Shinran wrote. And teachers like, okay, great, that, that's great. You know, you're you know, going to seminary, become a Shin minister, you should, right? He's like, what about the Lotus Sutra? Have you ever read the Lotus Sutra? So it's like, no. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and the teacher said, okay, sure. If you want to you know, understand Shinran, of course, read what he wrote, but also read what he read. Okay. Nowadays, Japanese Buddhism tends to be broken up into discreetly defined sectarian institutions. You have head temples and branch temples. You have orthodox teachings and a set canon of scripture. And you know, if you're going to be a priest or a lay devotee or whatever, like you're, there's this narrow track. You stay in your lane. You do your thing, right? The rest of East Asia, Buddhism doesn't work like that. And Buddhism in Japan before about 1600 or so also didn't work like that. Everything blended into everything else. Everyone borrowed from everyone else. There's a lot of fluidity across lines. And one of the sutras that helped you know, support that way of engaging dynamically with diverse forms of Buddhism was the Lotus Sutra. Uh, and in pre it, so nowadays, the Tendai tradition is very small, very... Um, you know, compared to any of the other sects, it's one of the smaller ones now. But throughout much of Japanese Buddhist history, uh, from early times on till, you know, like the 1400s, it was one of the dominant traditions. And the Lotus is absolutely central for the Lotus Sutra as well. Um, but we could, you know, expand this to, you know, covering various you know aspects of East Asian Buddhism. So today we're going to kind of get into some of the central themes of the Lotus Sutra and talk about kind of why this is such an important uh, text for scholars, practitioners, uh, but also why it's so fun to teach with. The, the, uh, uh, here at SUNY, I also teach a seminar on the Lotus Sutra where the first half of the semester, we're just reading the sutra slowly, uh, you know, methodically, and looking for all the um, ripples and seams within the text that might reveal certain things about the early development of Mahayana uh, that maybe the text isn't trying to part, impart but in other cases, things the text might not be trying to show, but ends up showing anyway. But we'll talk about that uh, more here in a moment. So let me share my screen. All right. So today we're going to be looking into the Lotus Sutra. So starting off with chapter one, the Lotus Sutra begins with the same phrase that most sutras begin with, thus have I heard. And in this way, the sutra is trying to show us that this is the words of the Buddha, Buddha Vachana that you know the, the buddha's cousin and attendant ananda is you know had this you know magical memory he was able to remember everything that the buddha said and like all of the sutras this one begins thus have i heard and therefore is purporting to be the um the words of the buddha okay um like most mahayana sutras the the audience for the teaching is you know limitless beings you have gods and dragon kings and bodhisattvas and buddhas and kings and monks and arhats and everybody's there as the buddha is getting ready to kind of reveal the big picture and that's what the lotus is about it's kind of the big picture what is what is buddhism really about 
what is the esoteric teaching. And, uh, and actually, you know, the, the presentation of a secret teaching is not just limited to so-called esoteric Buddhism, it's actually something we find throughout the Mahayana. You can even think of the Mahayana itself as a kind of secret teaching handed down for the few, the proud, you know, the, the, you know, the, the best of the best. Okay. As the Buddha is getting ready to, to preach, there's a certain contingent of arhats who get up and leave. Okay. And this event within the sutra seems to reveal to us this early tension between practitioners of the bodhisattva path and practitioners of the shravaka path. Now we have to remember that uh, when we're thinking about Mahayana Buddhism, nowadays we think of Mahayana as kind of its own thing, and then Theravada or non-Mahayana is kind of this other thing. But in the early Buddhist environment, these things were not so clearly defined. The thing that we now call Mahayana Buddhism, which we think of as a distinct kind of Buddhism, uh, did not emerge as a, as a thing separate from other forms of Buddhism until really late. We have evidence, perhaps, for uh, versions of Mahayana Sutras around the year 100, 100 BCE, perhaps, uh, but we don't have Mahayana Buddhism as, as a distinct kind of Buddhism until many, many years later. Okay? But what we do seem, what some of the texts seem to reveal, and that's what the Lotus Sutra is revealing here, is that there was tension emerging between followers of the Shravaka path and followers of the Bodhisattva path. And this eventually becomes what we now know as Mahayana and Hinayana, or what Mahayana Buddhists would call Hinayana. The word Hinayana, of course, means lesser vehicle. Nobody refers to themselves as Hinayana, uh, but some Mahayana Buddhists would say that there are those practicing a lesser form of Buddhism. One of the critiques that the Lotus Sutra has of the Shravaka path is that it is a selfish path, that it is a path for your own liberation, whereas the Bodhisattva ought to aspire for the compassion of a Buddha, the perfect compassion of a Buddha that embraces all beings. That's the idea. Now, in the modern period, because of the influence of Japanese scholarship, some Western scholars came to you know, imagine that the Hinayana just referred to Theravada Buddhism, but that is not the case. Uh, te um, now, Theravada Buddhists may have their own critique of Mahayana Buddhists, but um, you know, the, what the Lotus Sutra kind of is revealing is this, this hypothetical critique of non-Mahayana traditions. Now, one of the things that's really funny is that when we get into the East Asian context, or the Tibetan context, where everybody's Mahayana, the term Hinayana is just kind of a hypothetical category for I don't know, heretic or, or something like that, because there are no non-Mahayana Buddhists. So I think that's kind of a funny, interesting thing as well. All right, so why would this event start the sutra off? A certain number of disciples get up and leave, and then the Buddha says they've left because of their overweening pride. Here's the, the teaching. Here's, here's the truth. Here's, you know, the big picture. And one of the reasons why this event may be in the sutra is because as the Lotus Sutra is beginning to circulate in India, there are people encountering it who are saying, I've never heard of this. Why have I never heard of this? Did someone just make this up? Or, according to the sutra, at least, no, 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 we're not just making this up. Your teacher must have been one of those who got up and left, and that's why you haven't heard of it. That's a very interesting move that's being made here. Um, and we see many other Mahayana sutras making similar moves to explain where this comes from. It's not that we're making it up 500 years later. Rather, this was a secret teaching that was passed down and your lineage missed out. It's a very interesting rhetorical move here made at the beginning of the sutra. Okay. Then we get to chapter two. Uh, this is the, uh, I believe this, this one here, uh, this image is, a, is an image from a, uh, uh, I believe it's a, a, a Korean version of the sutra. And I just think it's a beautiful frontispiece here. Um, with gold, golden ink on uh, black or uh, uh, it's often purple paper. Um, in any case, so chapter two is called Skillful Means, um, uh, which we refer to as, in Sanskrit as Upaya. Now, in traditional Buddhist context, the Buddha is referred to as a doctor, a doctor who dispenses medicine according to the particular need or affliction of a person. Your problem, your affliction may be different than mine, and mine may be different from yours. Therefore, we need different teachings. Yeah, uh, it, this idea of Buddha as a doctor is also related to the Four Noble Truths. It, um, in fact, traditional Ayurvedic medicine has sometimes been said to have certain Buddhist analogs, or you know, may, may derive in some cases from Buddhism. Because think about the Four Noble Truths: one, there's a problem; two, the problem has a cause; 
three, there's a solution. And four, here's how you administer the, the cure, right? So I, I think that's a very interesting um, component of the Buddhist path is it is kind of medical in a way, you know? Um, one, we're stressed out. Number two, we're stressed out because we seek ultimate satisfaction and things that will not satisfy us. Number three, by understanding the nature of craving and attaining nirvana, that problem can be uh, resolved. And number four, the Eightfold Path, how to you know, put the path into practice. Yeah, so it's kind of like curing an illness. Yeah, in any case, this idea of the Buddha as a doctor, as someone who is dispensing different remedies for different problems, is one way to explain the diversity of the Buddhist tradition. Why is it that we have so many different approaches to Buddhism? Now, I, I have kind of been thinking for a while that the Lotus Sutra and certain other Buddhist texts are really about Buddhist diversity. How do we reconcile all of the, the different approaches to Buddhism? You know, is it that some are right and some are wrong? Or is it that the Buddha presented different things to different people at different times in order to uh, help and guide them? Yeah, yeah. So let's have a look at the next chapter. Okay, all right. Uh, chapter three, uh, parable. All right. The um, chapter three is about the burning house. And this is a really famous story. Many years ago, I was at a, a, I was at Japanese school, and I had to write an essay, and I couldn't think of anything to write about, so I just wrote about the the burning house. So I just kind of presented it as a story um, in class, and a friend of mine who who was from Vietnam was saying, um, I, "I've heard this story before. My grandma told me this story. What's that from?" And it was like, oh, it's, "It's from the Lotus Sutras." Oh, I knew it was from the Lotus Sutras. That's what it was, right? I thought that was really funny. Um, in any case, so the uh, the burning house. Um, has the Buddha kind of presenting this story. Once upon a time, there was a father who comes home to find his house engulfed in flames. He calls to his children, come out, come out, but they can't. So the father calls, you know, everybody can come out of the house and the kids are immersed in play and they're not listening. And I, I always kind of joke to my students, like if any of you, you know, you know, someday have kids or you've spent a lot of time around kids, you know that you tell them to do something, they don't necessarily do it. So the father has to come up with a way to convince the kids to get out of the house. You know, you tell the kid, hey, don't do that. You know, it could hurt you. They're not necessarily going to listen because because kids have their own way of responding to, to to things around them. So the father's like, OK, how do I get them out of the house? He says, hey, guys, guess what? Out of the outside outside right now, I have three carts, a deer cart, a goat cart and an ox cart. And each of them is pulling a cart that has um, all these great toys and fun things you guys will love. So come on out of the house. And all the kids come running out of the house. So th this is his upaya, his skillful means for getting the kids out of the burning house. Once they get out of the burning house, they realize that there aren't three vehicles, or th there's not three different kinds of vehicles, but rather each of them gets this awesome giant, go uh, giant white ox pulling a cart that's full of even cooler stuff than they could have imagined. So then the Buddha tells a story, and at the end he says, did the father lie? And the disciple's like, well, not exactly, because he was trying to save, you know, the, the children were in danger. They didn't understand what the danger was, so he had to come up with some way to get them out. So it's not really a lie, you know. So this is always a fun discussion in class. And the way I've heard some scholars explain it is that perhaps in ancient India, the concept of, an, of a white lie didn't exist. Because in order for something to be a lie, the intent has to be harmful. If the intention is to help you or to save you, then you know the, the, the ends justify the means. It seems to be what is being presented. So the three carts correspond to the Shravakayana. This is the path of those who hear the teachings of the Buddha and, and attain awakening as an arhat. Then we have the Pratyeka Buddha Yana. This is this is a kind of like a hypothetical category for, you know, like, so the Dharma that the Buddha teaches is not something he invented. The Dharma the Buddha teaches is the truth of the universe, which means that hypothetically, someone else could figure it out on their own. You don't have to be a Buddhist. You don't have to receive the teachings from the Buddha. What if there was someone who off on their own, you know, a solitary Buddha discovered the truth, the universal law, and then, you know, becomes one with the force, something like that, right? So it's kind of a hypothetical category. They're solitary, so we don't interact with them. Then you have a bodhisattva. And according to the standard model, the early Buddhist model, a bodhisattva is someone who, like Siddhartha Gautama, uh, pursues the bodhisattva path to become a Buddha, to reveal the Dharma in the world when it is not currently being taught. 
that that is one tradition within early Buddhism, one spiritual vocation you could follow. Uh, even within contemporary Theravada, there are some Buddhist monks who follow the Bodhisattva path. It's not exclusive to the Mahayana, right? but it becomes the, kind of the main path of what we now refer to as the Mahayana. Okay? So what this chapter is revealing is that, there's not, that, that, that these three vehicles ultimately lead to the one vehicle, the Ekayana. The Ekayana could be referred to as the Bodhisattva Yana, the Buddha Yana, or later on the Mahayana, the great vehicle that all paths ultimately converge. So again, this is another way of dealing with Buddhist diversity. It seems as if there are all these different approaches to Buddhism, but ultimately they could be perhaps be compared to paths all leading up the same mountain. Yeah. So let us continue. Jumping forward, we have the, the so-called apparitional city. Now the Buddha is, 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 one of the things that's really great about the Lotus Sutra is that there are all of these parables that uh, that just just make for good storytelling. You know, that, that, that this one time I was I was preparing uh, my lecture for class and my daughter came up to me and said, "Hey, what are you reading?" And I was like, well, "I'm reading the Lotus Sutra." It was you know in, in October. It was around um, uh, Halloween time. She said, "Are there any scary parts?" I was like, "Oh yeah, there are all kinds of scary parts." And then I started telling her some of the fun scary bits of the Lotus Sutra, which we won't necessarily get into today. But anyway, there's a lot of good stuff there. Lots of good good stories. Uh, perhaps one uh, another reason why the sutra has been so very popular. Okay, so in this story, the Buddha is compared to a magician uh, who conjures a city um, so that the fellow travelers will not um, fall into despair. This magician, uh, this, this this magical person, uh, typo here. Um, the, this this magical person is leading a caravan of of, of traders, merchants. And they start to get worn out. It's a long journey. So the magician conjures up a magical city and um, they're able to uh, stay for the night and rest. The next morning they wake up, everyone feels rejuvenated and the magician makes the, the city disappear. He says, okay, now that you're well rested, the final destination is not that far from here. Um, but I was worried you weren't going to continue. I was worried you would turn back. So I conjured up this apparitional city so that you could have some rest before we finish the journey. Okay. In this case, the Buddha is saying that the Nirvana he taught to the Arhats, they followed the Shravaka path to become an Arhat. This version of Nirvana um, was designed to give people an attainable goal so that they wouldn't be intimidated by the true goal, which is following the Bodhisattva path, which is much longer. Okay. Um, so again, th this reveals this tension between those following the Shravaka path to become the Arhat, and those following the Bodhisattva path to become a Buddha, saying that ultimately they all lead to the Bodhisattva path. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's, you know, it, it, here's a kind of, uh, do we call it deceit? I don't know, but it's a, a, a move that the Buddha makes uh, because he knows more than us. Throughout the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha is presented as a wise father who knows more about the path than we do. Uh, so we have the, you know, the, the father who comes home to the burning house. We have the magician here. And there are many other stories where the Buddha is presented as a father who knows better. Now, often in my classes, in response to this, I get a bunch of midterm papers that are feminist critiques of the Lotus Sutra, and I just love it. It's great, kind of critiquing this paternalistic approach to religion, Buddha as father figure, and so on. But one year I had a student who was like, I love it. I love my dad. Thinking of Buddha as a father is a thing I really like. And I was like, oh, I've never read that paper before. So she wrote a great paper. It was really enjoyable. And then that summer, she went to go live as a nun in Taiwan. So that was interesting. Um, in any case, uh, that many different many different approaches to the stories, uh, that many different approaches to how we might think about the Lotus Sutra. Um, now, here's another interesting chapter. We get to chapter 11, in which a jeweled stupa appears. So the Buddha is giving a talk. And suddenly, over the horizon comes this giant stupa. Here, you know, there's stupa, pagoda, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, and that lands next to him. Whenever we get to this point in the sutra in class, my students are like, you mean like a spaceship? This thing flies out of the sky and then lands? It's like, no, it's not aliens. It's not a spaceship. It's like, okay, sure, it's definitely, definitely aliens. It's like, no, it's not aliens. Anyway, so um, the stupa appears, and the Buddha walks up to it, knocks on the door, opens the door and there's already a Buddha inside. Then Buddha goes and sits next to him. So you can see this depicted in this nice Japanese scroll. Um, 
Now, what's interesting about this is that the, so the Buddha that appears, um, uh, um, was it uh, Taho Butsu? Uh, so he appears. Uh, and this is part of his vow, that he will appear whenever the Buddha is preaching the Lotus Sutra. Now, in classical early Indian thought, it seems to be that it was believed you could only have one Buddha in the world at a time. But here we have two Buddhas sitting side by side. There's a great book that just came out by uh, Don Lopez and Jackie Stone called Two Buddhas Se Seated Side by Side, um, which kind of makes me think that like they're that, you know it, it, it's almost kind of a um you know kind of a pun because it's two great scholars writing this book about you know the lotus sutra two buddhas seated side by side uh, is that also them perhaps um, but um so with this we have two buddhas in the world at the same time right well when a buddha appears in the world the the great cosmic mountain mount meru shakes when a buddha is born it shakes when a buddha decides, uh, attains awakening, it shakes. When the Buddha, um, you know, uh, uh, d decides to enter nirvana, when a Buddha passes away, at each of these key intervals, the cosmic mountain shakes. If we're having Buddhas all over the place, then the cosmic mountain would just crumble, it would just crumble because it's such a monumental cosmic event. The world can barely hold a Buddha. That's how powerful a Buddha is. But here we have two Buddhas seated side by side. And what's interesting about this, I think, is that it opens up the possibility for more. If we can have two Buddhas, why not three? Why not four? Why not more? What if all beings can become Buddhas? Okay, so th this is perhaps another way of talking about the idea of uh, the Buddha nature of all beings, that all beings have the potential to become Buddhas. What if we did that? What would the world be like if all beings attain their full potential and become Buddhists, right? So it kind of opens up this conversation about a this worldly pure land, perhaps we could say. Yeah. All right, now we get to chapter 14. This is one of my favorites. Um, so I, I, I want to mention that this one has, this, this chapter reminds some people of a text that was recently discovered called the Gospel of Judas. Now, if you know your New Testament, Judas is the bad guy, he's the antagonist, he turns in Jesus, and that's when the Romans arrest him. And there's all these uh, stories that circulate in, in the early Christian environment where, um, you know, the, these stories about how Judas dies. Like in one of the, I think, one of the Gospels that didn't make it into the Bible, Judas like blows up like a balloon and then just explodes. Um, but anyway, so he's the bad guy. In the Gospel of Judas, however, it's presented as if Judas was in on it all along, that Judas was there to make sure that Jesus would be arrested so that he could die for our sins and all this other stuff, right? So D Judas is presented as someone who was in on it all along. This chapter of the Lotus Sutra does something similar. Devadatta was the Buddha's evil cousin who was always jealous of him. Um, that there's a story uh, when the Buddha was a child and Devadatta shoots a swan and the Buddha protects the swan and they, uh, you know, you know, Devadatta says, that swan belongs to me because I shot it. And the Buddha says, belongs to me because I saved it. They go before the king and the king says, well, the one who tried to take the life shouldn't get it. The one who tried to preserve life should get it, right? So that's a nice story. Devadatta obviously can hold a grudge. Later on, Devadatta gets an elephant drunk. I didn't know that's a thing you could do. I can't imagine how much beer that took. Anyway, elephant gets drunk and he sends this drunk mad elephant to squash the Buddha. But the elephant arrives at the place the Buddha is and then bows to him. Um, we have the story of the Contemplation Sutra, the Nirvana Sutra, where Devadatta convinces Prince Ajata Shatru to put his father, King Bimbisara, in prison and so on. Like it was presented as this, you know, the, the, this evil corrupter of the prince. Um, it, 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 in another one, he kept, you know, almost like, like Wiley e. Coyote, he pushes a boulder uh, th that almost squishes the Buddha, it, like nicks his toe. Uh, and that's one of the great, you know, unforgivable sins alongside uh, uh, matricide, patricide, um, killing an arhat, um, uh, causing dissent within the Sangha and wounding a Buddha. Those are the five unforgivable sins. Anyway, so Devadatta is just swallowed up into hell. He's, he's so evil, the earth just opens up and eats him. Like he's the, he's the bad guy, okay? However, in the Devadatta chapter, something else is revealed. We, we come to learn that, you know, like the Gospel of Judas, perhaps, Devadatta was, you know, a, you know, a, a great teacher and an important part of, you know, the Buddhist strategy to save all beings. So this is the first part of the Devadatta chapter. So here's what you think is going on. 
but something else is going on entirely. So that this is surprising, this is dramatic. Then there's the second part of the Devadatta chapter. So this is a setup, I think, to a punchline that has to do with the second part, and that's about the dragon princess. So we hear about, the, you know, in the same chapter, it's called the Devadatta chapter. Personally, I'd call it the dragon princess chapter because I think she's neat, but it's called the Devadatta chapter. Um, where someone you think is lowly ends up being very high indeed. We see something with the, like the dragon princess as well, right? Uh, um, she lives at the palace on the bottom of the ocean, and sometimes secret teachings are entrusted to the dragons. The Prajnaparamita literature that is revealed to Nagarjuna later on is said to have been given to the dragon king by the Buddha. In any case, we hear this story that there's this awakened being the the dragon princess and here's the thing though according to textbook buddhism in order to be a buddha you have to be human male and an adult well she's non-human a child and female right? so she um it, you know th th someone inquires uh, uh so the dragon princess appears and she's carrying this jewel and she delivers it to the buddha and someone says you know how could she, you know how could she be awakened she's a you know a female child non-human and she said when i made this it makes this it was, she says when i made this offering to the buddha what uh, was that fast and then she performs the bodhisattva path i imagine kind of like that she performs the bodhisattva path including that little part about be becoming a male she says was that fast okay so, so i'm imagining her still like a, in her form as a you know, female, child, non-human, yeah? Now, there's some ambiguity in this story. Does she have to become a male in order to become a Buddha? Or is that the way she performs it, is that showing that even that component of becoming a Buddha is not that important? Okay. So you can read this either way, either as challenging and undermining Buddhist misogyny and male chauvinism or as affirming it. And people have read this in multiple ways. Okay. Just like, you know, Vow 35 of the Pure Land Sutra. Does it say there are no women in the Pure Land, or does it say, you know, beings who are female can choose not to be female in the Pure Land, right? There's different ways to read these texts. And that's one of the things that I emphasize in my classes is that there are, um, you know, chauvinistic and, uh, you know, misogynistic ways to read religious texts. If you are wanting to, you know, uh, find justification for, you know, you know, for helping women or oppressing women, religious texts are full of different resources you could do depending on your agenda, right? Uh, so in any case, as it turns out, though, in the East Asian context, Chinese Tiantai, Japanese Tendai, exegesis, and so on, uh, Ryuichi Abe recently wrote, wrote an interesting article on this. It seems to be that the dominant mode was to, I would argue, read this in the literary context of the text. Yeah, this is in the Devadatta chapter. If we find out that Devadatta turns out to be this great being, it would make more sense for this chapter to be challenging Buddhist misogyny rather than reaffirming it, because that would be more surprising. As surprising as finding out that Devadatta turned out to be a good guy all along. And that seems to be the direction that a lot of uh, East Asian ex exegesis has taken this text, is as a way of kind of affirming women. And as a result, the Dragon Princess has been this kind of, you know, in, in modern times, almost a feminist icon for, for a lot of people. So I think that's very, another very interesting component of the text. Okay. Now we get to one of per, you know, what we might call kind of the, the you know, one of the great episodes in the text. This is kind of one, when the Buddha reveals his final form, what we might say. Now, at the end of, what, what, this is what, chapter 16, so at the end of chapter 15, this is, it's called bodhisattvas coming from the earth. The earth cracks open, and it's all these bodhisattvas come flying out. And the Buddha said, these are all my students. So in the next chapter, someone's like, wait a minute, how could these be your students? These are advanced bodhisattvas. In order to be advanced bodhisattvas, you have to be practicing for eons and eons, and you're like an old man. You, know, the, it, you haven't been around that long. That would be just like if a small child pointed at an old man and said, this is my son. So the Buddha says, well, actually, what you know as Siddhartha Gautama, the career of the Buddha, is just one piece in a much broader cosmic drama. Where, so here we're presented with what I'm referring to here as the eternal Buddha, uh, Shakyamuni uh, plus. Okay? 
So if we look here at, at this sutra, and this is this is from the lifespan of the Tagata, this is chanted in many Buddhist traditions. It said, since I became Buddha, limitless kalpas, limitless cosmic eons have passed. And in that time, I am constantly teaching the Dharma and 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 you know helping beings along the path. Limitless beings have entered the Buddhist path. Uh, right. So what he's saying is that. You know the story you know about once upon a time there was prince siddhartha he left the left the palace sat under the bodhi tree conquered mara da, da, da. that version of the story is also upaya that's also one piece in a much broader picture that rather shakyamuni buddha has been you know working behind the scenes guiding beings along right so shakyamuni buddha does not necessarily die in the traditional sense but rather remains active in the world his enlightenment did not take place under the Bodhi tree as we know the story, kind of our basic Buddhism story, but rather took place in the infinite past. This means that what the Buddha really is, is something kind of woven into reality. It's, it's you know, we, so when we think of this term Tathagata, this is the thing that I've been thinking about recently, reading uh, uh, Shigaraki's book, Heart of the Shin Buddhist Path. He talks about Tathagata meaning thus gone one. And perhaps for uh, the, the Shravakayana path, the Buddha is one who achieved liberation from samsara and is gone. And if you follow the path, you can go to, you can get out of samsara, right? A Mahayana reading of Tathagata might mean thus come one, which means the Buddha is the one who comes from reality to guide beings to understand reality, right? So, so, it, so we can conceive of the Buddha as this cosmic force rather than a guy who taught some things. Right. And this is kind of this critical shift in the sutra uh, where we get, you know, we can see here's what's really going on. There's something else entirely. The Buddha is, you know, uh, you know, ultimate reality in a dynamic, engaged form, we might say. Okay. Next, we get to what is one of my favorite chapters, uh, the chapter on Avalokiteshvara. So one of the translations uh, uh, of the chapter is the gateway to every direction, uh, but I've, used, I've seen others that translate the chapter as uh, the universal gateway, and I kind of like that one as well. It's because we could think of Avalokiteshvara, uh, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, as you know, the, the universal gateway, as the, 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 as the one who opens the gate for limitless beings. Right. Avalokiteshvara is commonly associated uh, with protecting travelers, expectant mothers, women, and children. At the beginning of this chapter, it says, if you call upon Navalokiteshvara and you want a boy child, you'll have a boy child. If you call upon Navalokiteshvara and you want a girl child, you'll have a girl child. Um, so uh, throughout this sutra, we're told first that Avalokiteshvara and, and other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will appear to you in whatever form is most appropriate for you. So I sometimes jokingly say that for me, if Carl Sagan appeared, I would just listen to anything he told me. So for me, maybe she would take on that form. Right? So sometimes I'll ask my students, like, like what would be the form that's most, uh, most effective for you? Like, what, what is the form that this Bodhisattva could take? So it gives this long list. And there's a list of 33, I believe. Uh, you know, Avalokiteshvara could appear as a king, a queen, a boy, a girl, um, a nature spirit, a, a Buddha, Bodhisattva, Shravaka, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there's limitless forms that this bodhisattva can take to save you. Then it goes on to explain that this bodhisattva can free you from seemingly limitless afflictions. What if you're traveling through the wilderness and bandits or or monsters are trying to get you? Call upon this bodhisattva and they will liberate you. What if you're being uh, so up here in this pig, you're being pushed off a cliff? Call upon this bodhisattva and you will be suspended in the air like like the sun or the moon. Uh, what, what if you're being pushed like down here on the bottom left? What if you're being pushed into a fire? Call upon this bodhisattva and they will liberate you. What if you're on the on the high seas and suddenly your boat is attacked by sea monsters? Call upon this bodhisattva and they will liberate you. What if you're in jail, guilty or otherwise, and uh, you know you can call upon this bodhisattva and and the bars will break? What if uh, you're about to be executed? Uh, call upon this bodhisattva and the sword of the executioner will break. So there are all these great stories. Now, one of the things that, that I think is interesting about this bodhisattva is that in the um, Tibetan and Indian tradition, typically depicted as male. However, in the East Asian context, this bodhisattva is usually is often depicted as female. 
So usually when I talk about this bodhisattva, I tend to use the pronoun she because that's how I've seen her at, at, you know, in female form. But there are many different forms, many different manifestations of this bodhisattva. Uh, so the Sanskrit is Avalokiteshvara, the Chinese uh, is Guan Yin, and in Japanese Kannon. Um, uh, so th these are just you know the, the other names for this bodhisattva in those countries. Uh, but the name means something like the Lord who looks down and hears the cries of beings. Um, this term guan is to regard or to see, to, to contemplate, consider, uh, and yin is the sound. So you think of this, this, co this cosmic bodhisattva hearing the cries of beings and then responding to their needs. Yeah. So some scholars have theorized that uh, the inclusion of this chapter may have been one of the reasons why the Lotus Sutra becomes so popular. A lot of the early uh, spell texts and Dadani texts and mantra texts that are coming from India and Central Asia into China are concerned with Avalokiteshvara. This was, you know, the, a very popular object of devotion. And this particular chapter of the Lotus Sutra, chapter 25, seemed to have circulated independently as well. Uh, so, and, and, and there are many Buddhist traditions today um, that, that chant this chapter as part of their, their practice. All right. There are a lot of other fun chapters, a lot of other things we could get into. There's 28 chapters in the Lotus Sutra. I'm just giving some quick, interesting points of some of the ones that I think are really fun. I want to conclude with this one. Um, chapter 28 is dedicated to the Bodhisattva Samanta Bhadra. Some of the later chapters of the Lotus Sutra seem like they were kind of added on later. So there's been this kind of, you know, you know, composition by accumulation, you might say. Okay, so this Bodhisattva Samanta Bhadra. Right. Um, I, I sometimes like to say that uh, Avalokiteshvara is kind of like the big sister bodhisattva, like everybody looks up to. So Mantabhadra would be like the big brother bodhisattva. He's, you know, he excels in the bodhisattva path, and he's he's the bodhisattva all the little bodhisattvas want to be like. Okay, he's often depicted riding an elephant, holding a sword, and he has traditionally been the protector of Lotus Sutra devotees. In many East Asian Buddhist contexts. Your job as a monk is to memorize and recite sutras. You know, we often think of monks as kind of spiritual practitioners far away, but in a lot of contexts, a monk was a government employee. And your job as this particular kind of government employee is to recite Buddhist texts, to, um, to, to, to hold them in your memory and recite them to, uh, you know, cure illness, uh, make it rain, um, uh, extend the lifespan of the emperor, uh, pacify the realm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, uh, but memorizing a sutra is really hard. What if you forget something? It's okay. According to this chapter, if you call upon Samantabhadra, he will help you remember. Or if you skip a line, you forget a character, and you skip a paragraph, perhaps don't worry, he'll say the part that you forgot. So that's really cool. Uh, you know, so you can see why. People whose job it was to chant the Lotus Sutra would also, you know, want to, you know, you know be devoted to this Bodhisattva because he can help them do their job better, right? So these are some of the great themes and and ideas we find within the Lotus Sutra. I'm going to stop the share here.